Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sajjad Hassan. In 2015, a few of us, many of whom you will meet during the course of this webinar, got together to create the South Asia Collective as a regional resource center for documenting the situation of South Asia's minorities and to undertake local and regional advocacy. All of us, human rights researchers and activists from around the region, felt that regional space for collecting record, collect, sorry, collective recording, sharing and outreach was necessary to make local impact in the condition of the region's minority, uh, 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 religious, ethnic, caste, and uh, gender groups. The annual South Asia State of Minorities Report had been our flagship enterprise since providing an annual reckoning on the subject to create a baseline of evidence for public awareness and advocacy. Besides connecting to regional and international audiences, these reports have also helped us reach local minority-focused and minority-led initiatives throughout the region for frontline documentation, advocacy, and victim support. The 2021 annual report on the theme of hate speech against minorities in South Asia that we are very excited to be launching today is our fifth in the series, and not a moment too soon, as disinformation and anti-minority incitement, especially on social media, spiral out of control, affecting vulnerable minority communities throughout the region. Thank you to all the participants for joining us as we release the report. We are grateful and truly honored that uh, Ms. Punajilani, prominent lawyer and pro-democracy campaigner, has kindly written the full report and will be delivering the keynote address. And we are thankful that Mr. Akar Patel, another regional expert and conscience keeper, will be moderating today's discussions as we share our findings and together explore pathways to action. Now, before I hand over to Aka, let me make a few housekeeping, uh, housekeeping points. The webinar will last for about 70 to 80 minutes. We will begin with the keynote address. We will then have brief country level presentations by authors of key findings and recommendations, followed by discussions on regional trends and opportunities for action. This will be followed by a short Q&A session. Participants are invited to use the Zoom chat function to write down your questions and comments. The moderator will field these questions to the panelists during the Q&A. We will conclude with some practical thoughts on possible outreach uses of the report. And uh, the report itself will be available to download from the South Asia Collective website, as well as the website of the Minority Rights Group International. Both uh, addressing websites available to you. Uh, in chat. With that, and uh, without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Mr. Uh, Akar Pate, um, Chair of Amnesty India Board, to lead the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sajjad. Thank you to all of you for joining. I would highly recommend that you read the report. It's quite detailed and goes into all six nations uh, at a level of depth on the issue of hate speech, where reports haven't gone before. We'll try and post the link in chat uh, so that you can uh, access it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, be very brief in speaking about uh, Hina Jilani. She is truly a, a global figure. Uh, she was a special representative for eight years uh, for the UN uh, Secretary General on Human Rights uh, Defenders. Uh, she is also a part of the small uh, elite group of uh, elders that uh, Mandela set up. For us in South Asia, for decades, she has been an uh, inspirational figure um, uh, through the 80s and the 90s at a point when we didn't think that India would land in the same place uh, as the one that she had been uh, fighting in. And we look forward to what she has to say uh, today. Uh, we, uh, we'll also ask her what it is that we can do uh, by way of a means and a way forward once we listen to the various nations. Uh, Ms. Zilani, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akar. <clears throat> Greetings to all the friends from South Asia and elsewhere. Um, I must begin, first of all, by congratulating the South Asia Collective for such um, excellent work on uh, an issue of concern, um, which is uh, so common in uh, all the South Asian countries. And the way that you have presented the problem in the report 
makes it very clear that this is just not a, an issue that is um, um, limited to the rights of minorities, but the way that the um, South Asian countries have um, you know, managed diversity and plurality um, in, 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 in our region uh, shows not just that we are um, greatly deficient in being able to accommodate uh, people of different religions, castes, ethnicity, etc., but also that we have created within our own national borders such a conflict, social conflict, that is perhaps even more devastating to our societies and the states themselves um, um, than, than actual, uh, uh, um, you know, conflict, uh, armed conflict that we have all been through from time to time. This is a lingering problem and a concern that people like me have been worried about for the past 40, year, 40 years already. We started worrying about how uh, we as a country in Pakistan, for instance, are going to sustain uh, social cohesion, create harmony, harmony, harmonious, create an harmonious environment for everybody to live in peace within the borders way back in the 1980s when Pakistan suddenly came under a military regime that used religion to um, um, justify and legitimize the overthrow of a civilian government. At that time, frankly, apart from what was going on in Afghanistan in our neighborhood, I didn't realize that this was a pandemic much worse than what we are experiencing uh, in, the, in the form of COVID. And that religious, um, um, uh, uh, you know, religious and ethnic hatred is going to be something that we are going to export everywhere in this region. Today, I think um, looking at the situation of South Asian countries and the regional environment, I do believe that this is one of the most serious human rights issues that our societies are confronting. I say this because uh, not that uh, we do not worry about the, the situation of minority communities in, in um, different South Asian countries, but because also because I think that what we are going through today is a demonstration of how societies commit suicide socially and are able to um, bring themselves in a situation where authoritarianism and religious extremism in particular is destroying the, the harmonious uh, uh, society that most of South Asia perhaps witnessed many, many years ago, maybe even my generation does not remember uh, the good times uh, when living together in this region, despite your ethnicity, despite your uh, religion was not so difficult. Of course, other, other community groups, especially uh, the Dalits and, and um, you know, more marginalized um, caste-based uh, communities, have always had a bad deal in this region. At the same time, I felt that progress perhaps would bring us to a social equality status in some uh, countries faster than others. But unfortunately, we've seen a regression in most of these countries. Now, when you look at this report, this excellent report, that um, has been uh, launched by South Asia Collective. It gives us a very good idea of how the plight of minorities is so closely and clearly linked to political agendas, which have been used by different regimes in, in these uh, South Asian countries in order to, in many ways, um, uh, destroy the, even the hope of having a society where communities are at peace. And um, there are no measures that we can pinpoint today 
to say that these are some of the tools that are being supplied by the state to correct the environment that we have created where conflict, uh, violence, uh, hate speech is growing and are, is in many ways um, not just um, creating a social environment where people find that their security is very much uh, um, um, at risk, but also the state itself is being weakened. I can, I mean, you can, you just have to read the report and you will see how in each of these countries, um, be it Afghanistan, be it Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, or Sri Lanka, uh, the, the, uh, it seems like, you know, we are kind of following each other and uh, competing with each other on how we, how far we are going to go in creating these schisms in the society. Um, we speak about hate speech all the time. And um, in most of these countries, there is sufficient legislation. I think, in fact, in Pakistan, I feel that we have over-legislated hate speech. And the, the result of that over-legislation is that it, it becomes something that you take so much uh, so to take so lightly uh, and um, what what um, uh, should have been the objective of the legislation would be what would have been the protection of minorities it has now become a, a situation where i feel that the, these laws themselves are creating an environment where minorities I have become the target of these legislations rather than those that are being protected by this legislation. Just to give you an example of Pakistan, we have at least six particular laws in which hate speech is, uh, is, can be criminally prosecuted. Unfortunately, I cannot report today to this uh, gathering that the, uh, the hate speech against minority communities and, and bringing their security at risk in any way has been, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the objective of this legislation or where courts have used this legislation to uh, eliminate impunity for hate speech against minority communities. In fact, in Pakistan, for instance, it is, a, it is a good example to take because on the one hand, Pakistan claims, and, uh, and some of these claims are justified, that we have taken legislative as well as social policy measures for the protection of minorities. If, um, if uh, 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 I don't know if many people are here familiar with the event that happened in uh, 2014, the Supreme Court of Pakistan gave a landmark judgment after certain incidents have happened uh, whereby uh, the, some of the religious community, places of worship had been desecrated, the Kailash community in our northern areas was attacked, forced conversions were taking place. The Supreme Court tape took so much to notice of it. And the judge in that case, Justice the Sadhguru Hussain Jilani, gave a very, very, um, um, important judgment, whereby he directed the state and gave them 14 targets uh, for the protection of minorities. We have that judgment. And not only was this judgment given, the judge also had the sagacity to direct the Supreme Court to create a permanent implementation bench, which would oversee the implementation of those 14 points by the, by the government. That implementation bench is still working. And uh, some measures have been taken by that implementation bench. The Supreme Court has taken certain measures. But while these things are going on, on the other side, we have events that are totally country, these efforts. And therefore, there is no impact that we can see where the environment in any way is being improved for the existence of minorities. Pakistan is a good example to see because this is a Muslim uh, majority state. We at one point had um, a 7% uh, minority population. Unfortunately, because of we have, what we have done in the past 40 years with the, with the minorities and their rights, the minority population in Pakistan has actually depleted because people have fled away. We have lost 
uh, our diversity because the Parsis have left, many of the Christians have left, uh, and the Hindus have left, and this has had a devastating effect on our diversity in, in this country. We have a state that on the one hand fosters and uh, supports and uses for political purposes the religious extremist lobbies who in turn have a narrative that is extremely um, dangerous and poisonous for the minority communities, with the, which is why when the, uh, these groups target minority communities with hate speech in Pakistan, in particular, the, particular the Ahmadiyya community, and there is total impunity for that. The courts are helpless. We are now also witnessing that with regard to this particular community, you know, the Ahmadiyya community, access to justice has become almost impossible. And the blasphemy laws, all kinds of hate speech laws are actually now being used against the MDA community. As far as the uh, other uh, um, South Asian countries are concerned, you have seen what is happening in India. And I think at this moment, the, the environment in India it perhaps is perhaps the most foul because whereas in other countries, the state when things happen, even though they happen because of the um, lackness of the of the of the state itself and the uh, and the lacunas in their implementation of pro minority protection policies, the state at least the states at least or the governments disassociate themselves with events or incidents where hate speech has triggered violence against minority communities or a particular minority community. In India, in fact, I think there is more and more of a political uh, policy to glorify a, uh, hate speech and denigration of minority communities. And, uh, and I think this is something that we have to uh, really be uh, very um, astute in, in analyzing in order to be able to find out how this can be countered. Those brave human rights defenders, journalists, academics, um, uh, writers who are putting up a resistance and are trying to sustain the secular quality of the, the Indian, country, Indian society and the state uh, are really fighting a losing battle. And this is something that I think the uh, Indians themselves, uh, uh, people like us who, who belong to the same kind of um, 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 you know, the, the, the ideologies that we have of human rights, of uh, pluralism, of tolerance, they, I think, are realizing how difficult it is now becoming to, to protect the population against the poison of hate speech that is now being used as a political rhetoric and very much uh, as a matter of uh, empowerment of the elite. Um, uh, and 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 uh, and very much a, a an element of gaining uh, popular populist popular popularity. So this kind of populism is also uh, something that I think uh, other countries are experiencing, perhaps to at a lower uh, level than than India. But at the same time, in Sri Lanka, it is becoming really difficult to um, ascertain where the state stands here because the responses to the, of the state to this kind of rhetoric is very weak and in many ways so nuanced that you cannot really find any element of, um, of um, uh, 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 you know, a rejection of that kind of speech by the state authorities and the pol political elements uh, in many of these countries. I, I, am, I really don't want to go on about this, but I think one or two things that are very important are the, how the um, situation of minorities and the, uh, the, you know, the bitterness that we see amongst the minorities is going to, what is it going to do to these minority communities? 
Of course, we are looking at those who are the perpetrators, but look at what is happening socially and politically to the victims of this. Uh, of this. They are being alienated from the state for one thing. And when this alienation is happening, it is not difficult to imagine how it is affecting our democracies, how it is affecting the possibility of social progress, whether it is with regard to one minority on the basis of religion or with regard to another minority, with regard to ethnicity or caste uh, and creed. So, uh, so I mean, there is, there is now also an element of racism that is rampant in South Asia. And uh, this, uh, this is something I think that we really need to understand how um, politics and the polity of this region is being affected by how we are treating the rights of minorities here and how impunity is being created to an extent and to a limit where it will become very difficult for the state to sustain the um, basis on which um, uh, the, the citizenship is, is, uh, is uh, negotiated uh, with all the different um, communities uh, within the boundaries. Now, this is the internal issue here uh, within the state, but what about the situation of South Asia? South Asia as a region is now weakened even more. We never had a good history of, um, of um, uh, a strong regional uh, basis uh, and, and dialogue and uh, any kind of a regional platform intergovernmental uh, at the intergovernmental level where we could negotiate our, uh, our uh, interests as South Asians with the rest of the world. Today, we are so weakened and so isolated in uh, and, and kind of, um, we are now rather, uh, rather than being a, a, a regional entity, we are now just nation states who exist in close proximity with very little um, connection with each other where we can in any way collectively resolve these common issues of concern, like um, uh, the situation of minority communities uh, uh, in both, in, in all our countries. In fact, now I see that in the past, recent past, patriotism is now linked also to who you are and how many you are in a particular country. So this kind of majoritarian trend has intruded into our thinking as a, a, a nation or as a population uh, living in, in our own countries. This has weakened the prospects of South Asian um, uh, strengthening uh, and collectivity. Uh, Akal, you spoke about the 80s and the 90s. I think that was a good time where at least the civil society made the attempt to create social uh, networks and to create um, platforms for, 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 for um, pushing forward uh, an agenda for tolerance, for uh, adjustment, adjusting uh, uh, and accommodation uh, uh, of plurality and diversity. Uh, unfortunately, many, many factors now are also weakening our ability to create and sustain those platforms so that we as a population of South Asia can speak out in one voice and um, uh, make visible our concern and our resolve to fight this uh, and to resist these trends. Um, and that has to also be reclaimed by the civil society. I also believe that while the state and most of these countries that we uh, have in South Asia, the states have in fact um, uh, strengthened their ability to control, but uh, they have totally neglected their ability to give protection. So the state is growing stronger in one way and becoming totally weak in another way. Um, when you look at these incidents that have happened in both in all these countries, I don't think that any of these countries has escaped the kind of incident 
that we saw in, um, in Sialkot in Pakistan a few uh, weeks ago, where a Sri Lankan uh, citizen was lynched by a mob. Uh, these kind of in incidents, when they happen, there is a lot of um, hue and cry against it. But unfortunately, th this is never sustained by action. The result is that the, the population and the public uh, mind, the, the, the social mind that accepts this kind of violence, it never corrects itself. So I think a lot of the recommendations that have come in this report are important. Yes, they are important as far as the international community is concerned. We must, of course, call out for the international human rights system to uh, make interventions so that the problem uh, is made more visible globally. But at the same time, I think that the most important thing for us is to create platforms in this region so that we are able to sustain democracy, sustain the potential for growth of democracy, make sure that the rule of law is something that we propagate and are able to project and make visible to the decision makers and the ruling elites in our countries, how important it is for democracy, make sure that the institutions like um, the parliaments, the judiciary are be become our key targets so that um, not just that the, the rights of minorities are uh, protected and they should, that there is a zero tolerance for violence against minority communities, which has led to so much violence against them that they, their security is now at risk and many of them are now fleeing their countries and seeking refuge in other countries. But also at the same time, they must make sure that those who are trying to defend human rights and exercising their core functions as human rights defenders are supported sufficiently so that they, are, they continue to voice their concerns and to do whatever action on the ground that they can to protect the rights of minorities, to make sure that they enjoy equality in citizenship, as well as uh, have their, their, their freedom of religion, have their freedom of uh, movement, um, and, and more than anything else, retain their right to personal dignity. I think what is happening to some of the minority communities, whether these are based on religion or ethnicity or caste, especially the Dalits um, in some of these South Asian countries, I mean, Dalits in Bangladesh, Dalits in Nepal, Dalits in India, the right to uh, human dignity, which is the core human right, is being violated with impunity. And this has become so entrenched in what we call our culture that sometimes I think that these are stinking cultures which allow uh, humanity to be treated in the way that we do um, towards many of these um, uh, very vulnerable, very marginalized and very targeted uh, communities that we have in our different countries. So let me thank the South Asia Collective for their brilliant work. Um, I, I have read this report with, uh, with uh, a great deal of interest. I think it is a very good effort on your part to make the problem visible and also to very clearly state the underlying causes of why this is the situation in most of the South Asian countries. And I will end by saying that until and unless we review the way that we run our governments, the way that we um, negotiate our situation in the region and allow for better and stronger ties to move towards the right path and to give safe environment to all our citizens in the whole region. Uh, unfortunately, we will not arrive at a situation, at a position where we want to go. But, uh, South Asia is suffering a crisis of leadership. The civil society must fill in that gap and the civil society must make whatever possible uh, endeavors it can to not just strengthen platforms, but make those pla platforms even more vocal and more visible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and your warning. I hope that policymakers across the six nations that we are about to hear from pay heed to what it is that you said, to those who may not be fully familiar with the work of 
uh, Hina Jilani, I would recommend that you go to her uh, Wikipedia page and see what it is that she has done. There are links to plenty of uh, interviews that she has given. Um, those of us who have lived through the, the 80s and 90s and Zia ul Haq and Amusharraf know the kind of impact that people like her have made in the long term. Truly one of the inspirational figures of human rights in the world. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'll repeat that the link to our report is in the chat. I would recommend that you uh, download it. It's fairly lengthy and detailed, but it breaks down the issues by nation. Uh, in the next section, now we will look at these uh, six nations and what the findings are. And we'll start with uh, Afghanistan. I'll ask uh, Hafizullah Saidi to begin by telling us what the five main findings are. Thank you. Hi, uh, do you have my screen and my voice? Hi, everybody. Uh, good day, good evening, uh, good morning, depending on where you live. So um, it hasn't been uh, easy to work uh, on a very sensitive topic, uh, the issue of hate speech in Afghanistan. Uh, given the challenges uh, that we all faced uh, with, the, with the security issues, basically. Civil society has uh, been very limited uh, and for the human rights activists, it has been quite challenging. Uh, but anyways, the key findings uh, of the report in Afghanistan are, are as, as, as below. Uh, so the prevalence of head of speech uh, during Taliban's rule in the 1990s, uh, but also in the post-2001 Afghanistan have led to uh, persecutions and even massacre of ethno-religious minorities, namely the Hazara uh, Shia communities uh, and also Sikhs and Hindu uh, minorities in Afghanistan. Some of the ways uh, or, or methods that have been used uh, have been uh, symbolization, classifications, uh, discrimination, dehumanization and, and polarization of ethno-religious groups against one another. Um, and mainly you can see that in how uh, different uh, uh, violent extremist groups are being uh, polarized uh, or mobilized uh, using hate speech uh, to target uh, ethnic religious minorities in Afghanistan. Uh, the processes that are used uh, basically varies uh, into different uh, uh, sectors. So you can see the, the practice of hate speech uh, in elections uh, by political leaders uh, in their public addresses. Uh, but also you can see that in um, how security issues are being securitized. For example, there were um, a case that an um, Afghan National Army officer uh, publicly and widely uh, used hate speech uh, targeting a specific uh, uh, ethno-religious uh, leader, uh, but also targeting uh, his followers from that specific ethnic group. Uh, you can also uh, see uh, evidence of hate speech uh, during their election campaigns uh, and, and candidates' election campaigns. Um, so technically speaking, there has been a lack of me uh, legal measures to, uh, first of all, recognize hate speech, uh, but then to define and, and prevent hate speech. Um, the Afghan constitution does not directly uh, discuss or cover the issue of hate speech. There are a lot of uh, articles or uh, measures that are defining non-discriminatory policy, non-biases, uh, but not specifically hate speech. Uh, the government of Afghanistan and also the civil society, unfortunately, has not done enough uh, in countering hate speech. Uh, but on, on top of this, of course, uh, there are some uh, restrictions, uh, you know, ratified by the Afghan media law as well as the penal uh, code. Uh, but despite those, um, Again, those are not specific to head speech. Those are general, uh, you know, principles that avoid uh, social media to publish, uh, you know, head speech. Uh, sorry, to to publish uh, speeches or remarks that are based on ethnicity, religion, um, and, and issues like that. But despite these, uh, you know, media law and penal code, uh, social media platforms, namely Facebook, Twitter, and also TV and radio uh, channels, they have been used as tools to uh, spread hate speech across Afghanistan. Uh, so given all these key findings, two of the main recommendations uh, could be that first, the Afghan legislature should formally recognize, define, and penalize hate speech, which would be uh, the, the grounding uh, you know, step to start countering hate speech. 
Uh, but then the Afghan government uh, and also international organizations and civil society organizations should raise awareness because people uh, and even state institutions, they are not really concerned about the issue of hate speech uh, particularly. Uh, and then they have to develop and implement a comprehensive counter hate speech strategy that can help protect uh, minorities, ethnic and religious minorities in Afghanistan. So those are, uh, you know, a quick uh, brief of uh, our key findings and recommendations on Afghanistan. Do we have any uh, evidence gathering post the uh, Taliban takeover, Hafizullah? Um, yes. Uh, the tactic of uh, operation towards minorities, ethnic and uh, religious minorities, namely the Hazaras, uh, have been slightly changed. Uh, so we do not see the mass murder or, or massacre of ethnic religious minorities, but we see still it, it, is, it is happening in a different way. So you see first displacement of uh, ethnic religious minorities from their ancestral lands, uh, calling that they do not belong to those, uh, those areas. Uh, those are one of the ways, and it happens to not only the Hazaras, but also to the Uzbek and Turkmen minorities in other part of the country. Uh, unfortunately, the Sikh and Hindu minorities in Afghanistan, most of them, um, I could tell, well, the challenge for the moment is that we don't have access to information with the takeover of the Taliban. Uh, all the activists and, you know, uh, human rights defenders, they have been evacuated. Uh, so we don't know how many, we don't know the demographics. But yes, Sikhs and Hindus, as uh, one of the vulnerable communities, they have left the country. I can tell that, yeah, mostly all of them, they have left the country. We had a single Jew man who was residing in Kabul until recently, but he also left the country because of the, uh, you know, risks of persecution against religious and uh, ethnic minorities. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, talk about uh, what can be done to counter this. We'll move on to the next country, which is Bangladesh and Munjuru uh, Islam. I'll ask also to start with the five main findings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akar. I'm going to present uh, our findings. Uh, uh, that is that uh, hate, hate speech is a long uh, going tradition in this society, but uh, with the uh, uh, evolution of uh, social media, it has been increased significantly. And we found that in recent times, most of the uh, communal violence is, uh, incited from hate speech uh, has been started from a Facebook post that is, uh, and uh, there remain a huge uh, severe communal, uh, communal violence against minority, especially religious and ethnic minority. And since uh, 2012, uh, most of the viol uh, violence incident occurred in Bangladesh against minorities triggered by activities on Facebook. And we see that uh, uh, since 2012, uh, there, there has been uh, six to eight violent cases, uh, violent incidents against minority and uh, trial has not been finished yet in any cases of violence. Uh, among the minority communities, uh, Hindus face the most hate speech and hate speech related violence. Uh, case, case hate speech also prevalent uh, against uh, Dalit communities. And uh, another uh, uh, important thing is that Ahmadiyya community, though they belong to the Muslim faith, uh, is often called by the non-Muslim or Qadiyani by certain Islamist group and uh, they face violence uh, everywhere in the country. Uh, the, their schools, their mojit has been attacked uh, severely in the, uh, is found that in, uh, since 2019 to 2020, we found the six to seven incidents of uh, uh, attack on their mosques and on their schools. Hate speech and related violence against minority communities is uh, uh, primarily greed induced, that is uh, related to the grabbing of their land and properties. And it is also economically motivated uh, political violence. Uh, Constitution of Bangladesh adopt, adopted secularism and written Islam at the same time uh, as the state religion. Uh, uh, they uh, run together and there is a, a huge confusion and uh, among the minority communities uh, regarding their position and regarding their uh, rights of citizens where uh, state religion is Islam. And another thing is that uh, at the same time, secularism is, uh, is still in place in the constitution. 
uh, there is no specific laws in Bangladesh uh, to address hate speech. Uh, recently, the government has taken, uh, adopted an uh, act uh, that is a Digital Security Act, which is very controversial. Uh, it has uh, uh, some sections relevant to hate speech uh, or defamation in any digital platform. But uh, we have found that uh, uh, we have found that it has been used uh, actually against uh, religious minorities, especially Hindu minorities, uh, uh, for their hurting religious sentiments of Islam or, or Islamic values. Um, our recommendation in this uh, uh, regard that uh, we have to government or social organization or others uh, uh, or political parties has to raise the public awareness of the importance of uh, respecting pluralism and of uh, the dangers posted by hate speech, uh, create awareness to challenge attitude of the people towards religious harmony and tolerance, and ensure proper investigation of all incidents of communal violence uh, uh, against uh, religious and ethnic minorities are being perpetrators to trial, ensure their punishment, and uh, the most important thing is uh, end of the culture of impunity. And um, uh, I'd like to share another um, uh, recommendation from our side that we have an anti-discrimination act that has been drafted in 2013, but still nine years has gone, it has been finalized yet. If the government uh, ad adopted it, uh, uh, soon, then uh, we can uh, protect the rights of Dalit communities against hate speech. Uh, actually, case hate speech can be addressed at, uh, in the court level. So thank you all. This is my presentation. Thank you very much, Munjurul. Could you very briefly tell us what the effect of hate speech in neighboring countries is on minorities within Bangladesh? Thanks. Actually, it has a uh, link with the neighboring countries where there is a, a communal violence uh, uh, the vested interest group, uh, they uh, try to uh, uh, make it here. Uh, and I have said that this is actually most of the time it is uh, uh, guide uh, induced, it means that uh, land grabbing is a very common uh, practice in Bangladesh against the Hindu uh, religion. Whenever there is a communal violence in India, they try to. Uh, 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 they try to uh, make something here so that the Hindus of Bangladesh can uh, uh, go away from the country and they can grab their land. So this is very common here. So I think, can I, can I say one, one line, Akar? Yeah, I'm from Bangladesh, Jakir Hussain, that your question was a bit different, but I can I can tell later, okay, okay. That's allow other countries, yeah. Thanks, uh, we'll have uh, Sajad, uh, speak about India next. Thank you. Thank you, Atta. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide to share, but I'll just uh, uh, read uh, from the statement. Um, thank you. Um, Indians have experienced a steady din of anti minority hate and hostility, especially since 2014. Recent public calls uh, in religious congregations for mass killings of Muslims and online campaigns of the sale of women on auction apps are but the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Hate speech against minorities, many reaching the United Nations threshold of top level incitement to hostility, discrimination, and violence have become normalized. Whilst Muslims have been the target of a lot of these campaigns, Christians and Sikhs have also been the subject of such organized attempts at vilification and hostility in local and nationwide campaigns, as have Dalits, Adivasis, and women. The consequences of these unrelenting campaigns of hate against vulnerable minority groups have been severe. They have frequently led to loss of life, limb, and property in low intensity individual as well as mass violence episodes, as and have encouraged harassment, vilification, and economic and social boycotts of minority communities, whilst preventing them from exercising the basic rights. Anti-minority prejudice in society is hardened, reinforcing discriminations. Equally, the incessant campaigns of hate on social media, TV channels, and in physical spaces is polarizing society, creating permanent fissures, increasing risks of violence and conflicts, in a deeply mixed society. An Indian democracy, uh, democracy stands diminished with institutions losing credibility in the eyes of large sections of society and the world community for their inactions and the impunity they made. A lot of this is in the public domain and I encourage you all to read our co uh, collation of the campaigns of hate and their real world consequences in our report. 
but let me to the reward the little time I have to explore briefly the enablers of this runaway hate, uh, to unpack a bit its drivers, and especially what we can and should do within the means available to us to challenge it. The danger is clear and present, and now is the time for concerted action. On the drivers, our research points to the following. Politicians of all hue, but especially of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, play a significant role in initiating and amplifying hate campaigns. By relying on sectarian polarization and outbreaks of anti-minority violence to garner votes, BJP has created an ecosystem that incentivizes hate and fosters impunity. To aid this effort, an infrastructure has been created with so-called IT cells and control over print, electronic, and social media, and a large number of other platforms allied to the ruling party, working in coordination to spread anti-minority hate and polarize society. As we saw in the recent expose on Tech Fog app, these are engineered to automate hate and manipulate trends across platforms. India's large and affordable internet coverage, an asset to bridge the di digital divide, seems to have added fuel to the fire. Hate and dangerous speech has had a free run on social media platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp, with little, uh, little breaks applied to these tech, uh, by these tech companies, and, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, or authorities whose job it is to regulate tech companies. Many discriminatory laws and regulations place now, including Citizenship Amendment Act, anti-conversion and so-called love jihad laws, prevention of cow slaughter laws, as well as national security legislations provide the context to how anti-minority hate campaigns are set up and played out. Sajjad, so, may I just uh, interrupt to ask whether you also have a slide that you can share with us? I'm afraid I don't have one, but I can convert this into a slide and share it uh, later, if that's all right. Please continue. Thank you. Similarly, constitutional measures for protection and promotion of traditionally marginalized communities is used cynically to mobilize hate and uh, vilify Dalits and Adivasis in physical and online conversations. A key failure has been of institutions to regulate and check hate and incitement. Laws in place are inadequate and they are enforced very selectively. Secondly, legislations are now being tightened to restrict free speech, especially by dissenters and minority activists on the pretext of hate. Thirdly, law enforcement agencies have mostly been loath to act in hate speech cases concerning minorities to investigate and prosecute perpetrators. And finally, watchdog bodies such as the Election Commission and the Human Rights and Minority Commissions have been uh, slow to move, if at all, and courts have, when they have intervened, done so reluctantly. To sum up, the situation is dire, and if urgent action is not taken, the nation could be sleepwalking into a potential crisis. So to the recommendations now. Docu uh, number one, document and raise awareness about the serious hate speech problem in the country. Government should be doing this, but in the absence of any effort, uh, it is left to civil society groups and especially to great journalists and activists to document whilst also challenging in real time the waves of hate and misinformation campaigns. How can we, as collectives, as, as, as concerned individuals, protect and promote these brave individual and collective enterprises and amplify this, uh, their voices? is a challenge that we must uh, uh, embrace. Secondly, create pressure on tech companies not to let themselves be used as platforms to peddle hate. The likes of Facebook and WhatsApp have mostly re resisted these calls or moved grudgingly, prioritizing profit over human lives. A good example of this dragging defeat is uh, Facebook not releasing the report of the human rights assessment that we conducted in India. Uh, of which, uh, which was forced to commission over a year ago. How can we collectively create uh, the incentives for large uh, tech companies based overseas to act on uh, the uh, hate playing out in the platforms? Number three, uh, United Nations and indeed the world community must invest more uh, in monitoring hate and dangerous speech and related developments in India indeed the rest of South Asia, and issue public alerts, including asking India to abide by its international obligations. And finally, promote and strengthen inclusive voices, including interfaith alliances within country and regionally to educate public minds on the dangers of polarization to society and the nation and how to bridge the chaos that is being created. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sajjad. And uh, just to repeat, we've got a link of the report, the full report, which is about uh, 300 pages or so, quite uh, detailed uh, in the chat link. We'll move to Nepal and uh, Sudeshna Thap. Mm, thank you, Mr. Patel. Well, let me try and share my screen first. Um... Sudeshna is most likely COVID positive and has joined us despite her not being there. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sudeshna. Uh, could you make the screen a uh, full screen and there we go. Thank um you. can you can you see it now? Perfect. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Um, so I'll try my best to some of the key findings of our chapter and uh, keep things as uh, brief as possible. Um, I'll begin by saying that even though Nepal I is behind the that I posted earlier, I don't know whether the others can see it. I can't. I, I sorry, you... okay. Um what okay. Can, you, yes. can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank great. Great. Okay. So um, I'll begin by saying that uh, even though Nepal is behind the curve in terms of the level of hate speech and other atrocities, as seen particularly in neighboring India, as was just pointed out by our colleague Sajad, but also other parts of South Asia, there are several warnings that Nepal could potentially follow a similar path. Speaking of uh, minority groups in Nepal, males have dominant social status over females and uh, individuals belonging to gender and sexual minorities, um, hill upper castes over Dalits, hill groups over Tarai groups, and Hindus over other uh, religious groups. While uh, intersectionality persists in each of these groupings, discrimination and exclusion generally do uh, follow the pattern. Um, large populations such as religious minorities, Madesis, women, Dalits, and Jandratis have remained uh, excluded and um, marginalization of mar uh, minority groups remains strong uh, even to this day. Um, while uh, we don't have laws that expressly uh, prohibit hate speech, our constitution as well as several other laws including the Electronic Transactions Act and the Press and Publications Act, uh, for instance, uh, provide for um, imposing restrictions on uh, acts perceived as undermining the sovereignty, territorial uh, integrity, nationality, and independence of the country, or um, acts seen as uh, jeopardizing uh, harmonious relations between people of various castes, tribes, religions, or communities. We also have laws that um, provide controls on um, online journalism. Um, so generally uh, speaking, our laws as well as practices tend to demonstrate uh, Hindu centricism. Uh, incendiary uh, news reports as well as derogatory and uh, vitriolic comments against religious minorities, particularly in cyberspace, are on the rise. Um, in our chapter, we have presented uh, comments and posts extracted from various social media platforms and online news portals that are clearly very uh, pejorative and derisive. Um, 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 I'll, um, I can just read out uh, two such comments from an article on an uh, increasing number of Christians in Nepal. Um, Christians have no humanity, they just want dollars. That was just one of the comments in an article. Christians, uh, Christian religion is like the Ebola pandemic. Uh, similarly, a lot of Muslims have also been uh, gratuitously targeted. There were also several news reports of Muslims being singled out for their religious practices uh, a few weeks into the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Um, hateful expressions against Madesis is also common, both in cyberspace and uh, in the real world. Um, the content of an alarming blog page named um, anti Dhoti Online, for instance, demonstrates the extent of vitriol against Madesis in the form of racist poems and jokes. Um, also, uh, Madesi appeals for rights, inclusion, and recognition as Nepali uh, are often labeled as secessionist and frequently as uh, pro-Indian. Um, indigenous Tharus, similarly, of the southern uh, Tarai Plains have also been routinely harassed and violently uh, suppressed by the state and subjected to discrimination and uh, derision. 
um, speaking lastly of gender and sexual minorities, uh, while Nepal's legal regime has been lauded as one of the most progressive, not only in the region, but uh, globally, with regard to protection of LGBTIQA plus rights, several studies have pointed out that um, Nepal's gender and sexual minorities continue to face persecution and abuse and are frequently subjected to human rights violations, stigma and uh, discrimination. Uh, videos, photos, articles, and other content featuring individuals from Nepal's uh, LGBTIQ, LGBTIQA plus community posted on various uh, mainstream, uh, mainstream social media platforms are rife with uh, vitriolic and derogatory comments. Um, similarly, um, despite an overhaul in the country's legal system, violence against Dalits is also rampant, and Dalits are still subjected to uh, discrimination and social stigma in various public settings. Um, in a prominent recent case, we saw five men killed in Western Nepal after a Dalit man tried to elope with a so-called high caste girl he wanted to marry. And in uh, another similar incident, we had the midday meal program uh, in a school. It had to be suspended um, in Southern Nepal after the school appointed a Dalit woman as the cook um, and the head teacher, who was apparently an upper caste male, refused to hand over the kitchen to her. So instances uh, like that are, uh, are rife. Um, I'll stop there with the key findings Thank and you. I'll... Um, Thank you. Some uh, of those things will find resonance with those of us who follow news here in India as well. Uh, before we move to Pakistan and uh, Elena Alam, I'll just repeat two things. One is that you can put your questions in the Q&A box that's there at the bottom on the right, if you are on a, a computer. And uh, the link to our report, which is about 300 pages long, is in the chat. Uh, thanks. And Elena. All right, thank you very much. Let me just um, start sharing my screen. Um, is this visible to everybody? Yes, thank you. Okay, something happened. Um, sorry. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you very much. And I'd, uh, I'd immediately go to the findings of our Pakistan uh, chapter. Um, and I just wanted to say, first of all, that um, the exercise itself for us was very interesting because we were going through analytics and um, uh, we also found that a lot of uh, social media analytics on, on, on hate speech, uh, the way we did it in the Pakistan chapter now had not been um, uh, done before. So we hope that uh, this is something um, uh, that can be carried on by civil society. And of course, we'll come to that to the end. Uh, at the end of of, um, uh, of our session today. But we're starting with the key findings. Uh, so one of the major findings that we have is that the indoctrination and institutionalization of hate speech, uh, it really counters and provides loopholes for the constitutional guarantees uh, that are provided uh, for the safeguarding of, uh, of citizens and, and recognizing uh, religious minorities as uh, citizens of Pakistan. And I think uh, as our honorable um, keynote speaker had already mentioned in the beginning, Pakistan is one of those countries that in fact is over-legislated. Um, and then uh, we also find that uh, a lot of loopholes have uh, come around and, and in fact then it is the religious minorities who have suffered um, um, at, at, the, at the brunt of these loopholes and, and um, this kind of institutionalization of, of hate speech. And I think when I um, also when I say institutionalization, and I'll come uh, again in my second finding to um, the political uh, point about this. Uh, one example is when um, um, adverts in newspapers are also particularly targeted to um, religious minorities, especially Christians, in which you are they're asking for um, uh, for sanitary workers to be particularly Christian, and that has been something that has been spoken about a lot. And then it also kind of you know gains momentum. On, uh, on online and both offline spaces as, as we have seen. Um, the second finding is that political and ideological uh, facilitation of religious majoritarian groups um, and discrimination then by the police and the courts, it, it fuels hate speech and threatens the lives of religious minorities. And often, I mean, historically, not just you know at the time that we were writing this report, but also before that, there are several instances of, um, <coughs> sorry, of, 
uh, of violence, mob violence also um, against uh, minorities. And these are, um, um, these have of course been Christian villages as well, Hindu villages, worship places, um, attacks on um, uh, Ahmadis, the Ahmadiyya community, and as well as the Shia community also um, widely, which has been seen in the recent past and that we've mentioned in the report. And an example of this political and, and ideological facilitation is, is the support that uh, the, uh, the Pakistani governments and, and, um, uh, and authoritarian uh, 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 wings of authority have given to uh, radical um, uh, groups like uh, the Tehreek e Labek Pakistan. Um, and we also speak about that in, in the report. Um, and thirdly, the draconian blasphemy laws um, end up uh, criminalizing the victim rather than ensuring proper investigations into the act of hate speech itself against victim. And this has been um, um, uh, noticed a lot in even if we uh, might we look at on, both online and offline spaces, um, uh, that even if um, something comes up uh, as a minority, religious minority citizen, being act the actual victim, the blasphemy laws end up um, criminalizing the victim itself. Um, so that is also something that we, we point out. Um, hateful acts and material in offline spaces is, is a major, major uh, factor and something that we feel needs to be built on, uh, um, uh, which is in textbooks, loudspeakers used by cl clerics still, um, and in print and electronic media. Um, this creates trends both on social media, further exacerbating both online and offline abuse. So this is kind of, you know, this whole, um, it just go, goes on like ping pong. So if it's, it, it, it gains momentum, Online, it'll gain momentum offline. And if it starts offline, it'll also gain momentum online. Um, and there are several examples that we point out in the report with uh, particular hashtags, especially. And we've gone in very, in a lot of detail um, talking about uh, hate speech against the Ahmadiyya community and the Shia community. And um, uh, statements that have been fueled both by political actors, civil society, um, um, and citizens uh, of Pakistan as well, uh, in fueling that and saying that either Ahmadiyyas or calling them uh, using slur words as Qadiani and um, Shias are uh, the world's worst uh, infidels. Uh, so uh, translating that into uh, the kind of hashtags that, that, uh, that you would see. And then solidarity or rights-based discourses are negated by radical groups to build their own majoritarian religious narrative. Um, so it also is, is, is kind of a, a tool to coerce. Um, and we've seen that uh, rapidly um, in the recent years also in, in, in Pakistan, um, where these religious uh, uh, and hyper-religious discourses are, are, have been given more space. Um, uh, quickly jumping to uh, the recommendations um, <coughs> to, that we also ensure the implementation of the constitutional uh, rights in line with the UDHR, um, um, something we delve into in the beginning in the introduction of the report, um, as well as the Jilani judgment, which our uh, honorable keynote speaker also raised uh, right in the beginning. Um, and this was a landmark judgment, as she said, um, it was in uh, 2014, um, and it, it must empower non-partisan bodies like the National Commission for Minorities to work without coercion um, and uh, such bodies to be uh, to be formed as an act of parliament uh, and of course um, um, it would then um, also lead to other oversight over curriculum and over other uh, mainstream discourses um, rather than um, something that is absolutely counter uh, uh, countering uh, our narrative which is the formation of this um, religious body like the Rahmatul Alameen uh, kind of um, uh, body that the prime minister formed that, that rather has to see uh, whether or not Pakistan is going on the right religious path. So um, rather um, we would really like a focus on this, on the, on the Jilani judgment as well. Uh, and then consciously and actively uh, remove hate content from textbooks and other material in an effort to reduce this hyper religiosity element that we see that kind of also fuse all these other findings that that um, that I just spoke about. Um, so thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, so far from what can be seen, I think India is the clear winner, but we will we will know soon. We have our last nation up ahead, uh, Sri Lanka and Harindri Nikoria. Thank you very much. I will try to be as brief as possible. Uh, I believe the slide will come up on the screen. And thank you in advance for that. I will start sharing on the findings. Uh, so the first would be how the International 
a covenant on civil and political rights act in Sri Lanka has been used to stifle freedom of speech and expression on the pretext of preventing incitement to violence. And the abuse of this law has been seen, uh, for example, in the arrest of author and poet Shaktika Satkumara and of activist Ramzi Razik. Uh, also the misuse of certain legal provisions, again, infringing on the freedom of expression. Uh, this includes uh, arrests and detention under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Uh, and this includes uh, the illegal arrest and detention of uh, the lawyer Hijaz Hezbollah, who continues to remain uh, in detention. Uh, moving on to the intensification of anti-Muslim sentiment online, uh, that exist existing narratives uh, sort of intensified uh, framing Muslims as bioterrorists and super spreaders of the virus on social media, uh, and also the decision to impose mandatory cremation for all victims of COVID-19, uh, despite protests from the Muslim community, that this also uh, created um, anti-Muslim content online and also uh, did lead to organized expression of dissent against this policy by civil society. Uh, the fourth finding was the spread of uh, misinformation and disinformation with the potential to cause racial tension around the presidential and parliamentary elections in 2019 and 2020. Uh, so this included uh, sort of false news updates with potential to cause racial tensions being amplifying through the use of paid advertising on Facebook uh, and several other points which I won't go into detail about. Uh, finally, the presence of coordinated inauthentic behavior online in the form of targeted and well-coordinated campaigns, which amplify and sp uh, spread inauthentic content, distorting public perceptions. Uh, there are two main recommendations I would like to share. Uh, would be to increase critical thinking skills in the digital space and digital literacy education that would empower citizens and especially youth with tools to critically assess and respond to dangerous speech. Uh, and a second one for to today would be to continue to engage in conversations with social media platforms uh, to address removal of harmful speech online, including widespread circulation of disinformation on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there was a comment that uh, Zakir wanted to make on the Bangladesh piece, which maybe we can have now before we go to Ms. Ajilani again. Or if not, okay, maybe we can have that later. Uh, uh, Ms. Zilani, we'd like you to give us a few tips on what the way forward might be in each of the countries or uh, uh, generally speaking, how do we counter this as a civil society and media, given that most of the states that we are speaking about are legitimate and respond to citizens, at least formally, what are the routes that we have that are uh, that can be used? Thank you. I think many of us are already using it, but one or two things that come to my mind, for instance, is that we broaden our circle and uh, include, uh, for instance, parliamentarians, um, and we include, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil society sectors like um, uh, the lawyers, the journalists, and in some way also demonstrate through the social media where we see uh, a lot of problems occurring, as the speakers have just outlined, that we also use the social media to display and demonstrate our diversity and our ability to sit and talk about these issues. I think our populations and our people generally need to see that we are people of South Asia and we are diverse and we have different religions and yet we have common concerns in all these countries which we are collectively willing to resolve and to speak to our um, political elite in one voice. So I think this use of the social media can be perhaps very positive if somebody will take the initiative of creating that kind of platform and all of us take the time out to participate and show our faces so that people are get used to diversity, get used to the fact that South Asians do speak to each other, even though we have these visa restrictions and we cannot perhaps meet um, uh, physically as often as we used to be able to. Now it has become much more difficult. So let us create those virtual platforms till, which, till, we, are there, uh, till we are able, able to uh, restore the ability to meet physically and create um, stronger networks. I think also um, this whole uh, 
question of um, seepage. You know, Nepal, for instance, I was in another meeting a few days ago and some of the Nepalese human rights defenders were very worried how the concept of Hindutva is now seeping into the populist rhetoric in Nepal and increasing the, the number of communities that are now being targeted. But the, added to the Madesis and the Dalits, now it's the Muslim community, which is also now um, uh, uh, being targeted for, for vilification. So these are some of the things. Other thing, another thing, Elaine, I just want to remind you that Pakistan really doesn't have a national commission uh, on minorities. This is an executive body that has been created in a very ad hoc and discriminatory manner. We have a statutory based a national commission on women. We have a statutory based national commission on children. This national commission is just a body that has been placed in the religious uh, ministry, which is doing nothing. Uh, in fact, is act actually, I think this is more of a counter um, uh, thing. And we are in the Supreme Court, the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, which is the NGO that I had, is in the human right, uh, is in the Supreme Court now, uh, challenging this and asking that uh, according to the Jelani judgment, we must have a statutory based um, uh, human rights, uh, national human rights, uh, national minority commission which is empowered to make sure that, you know, the kind of curriculum that we are using to um, pollute the minds of our youth and our children and the way that we are treating the uh, whole concept of uh, Pakistani nationhood um, minus any minorities. So these are some of the things I think I wanted to say also on um, interfaith uh, initiatives. Very briefly, how is it that given we have a common law system and we, at least notionally, we have the a judiciary which does have some element of uh, oversight, how can we as civil society use that process better than we have in the past? And how, what are the lessons that we can learn from Pakistan that we can apply in the rest of uh, South Asia? Uh, look, uh, if, uh, if I understood your question, um, uh, you know, Akar, Pakistan's constitution has a very unique um, a jurisdiction that it gives to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court can take notice of any uh, situation where the, uh, um, there is a matter of public uh, importance for the enforcement of fundamental rights, and they can make, give directions for the implementation of uh, an enforcement of fundamental rights in that way. So there is an original jurisdiction. We can directly go there and petition the Supreme Court. We and we do use that. We have that as well in India, and therefore I think what, what your experience is will make all the more sense for us uh, to examine. Yeah, but I mean, we don't always get a positive response from the Supreme Court. Obviously, there are weaknesses in the way that this so motto jurisdiction is being used. And we are some, some, sometimes very unhappy with the way that the Supreme Court overreaches its, uh, uh, its jurisdiction and gets into um, stepping into the domain of the parliament and and, and, and not uh, uh, respecting the uh, other domains. So these are some of the things that we do, but some areas we are still doing it. And thanks to the Jelani judgment on this minorities issue, there is an implementation bench that meets regularly and hears issues with regard to the, um, the, the minorities. But you know, the problem, as I said earlier, is that on the one hand, you are taking certain steps and on the other hand, you're countering those steps by other social policies and political policies. You in, encourage hate speech, you encourage religious extremism, and yet you think that at the popular level, you're going to be able to save the minorities from the kind of insecurities that they uh, experience. So these are some of the problems that we have. I also want to make one very short comment on interfaith in, in initiatives. You know, in Pakistan, the, the worst thing that I have seen is that all these interfaith um, initiatives are being taken at a very surface level and by religious uh, scholars and religious leaders. That should not be it. I think if there is to be an interfaith religion, uh, interfaith initiative, it has to be on a very secular basis to, to again demonstrate the work, what I said and make visible that diversity is a reality of this region and, uh, and of our countries. And we as, as, as citizens, or of a particular country or population of a particular region are 
are taking into account uh, the, the, the common issues that affect our everyday lives uh, in a very secular way, in a very political way, because these are political issues, and in a manner in which we are trying to create the impression that uh, uh, um, you know, people uh, must move away from, from the hegemony of, these, of the religious class. Thank you very much once again for your time and your wisdom. We are really privileged to have somebody like you, particularly at this point in time for many of our nations. Uh, for those of you once again who want to know what it is that Ms. Dilani has done and has gone through, her Wikipedia page has a lot of links, which I recommend very highly. We will move to the last part of this uh, program, which is the uh, Q&A. Before that, there was a comment from Zakir that we miss if he's online uh, perhaps yeah 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 yeah, yeah. just uh, i'm here you know quickly i would like to uh, let you know that bangladesh has no protective law so you know some the mistakes are there people are saying that there is a law we do not have anything in the constitution that said there should not be discrimination on the ground of caste religions and minorities so that is the only uh, uh, three words are there uh, after that there is nothing because we are pursuing, as Monzu said, that we are pursuing an anti-discrimination. Good news is that our uh, after after ten years, our uh, cabinet division has approved this uh, uh, draft last week. So this is a good news. Hopefully, it will go to the parliament very soon. So this is the one success that you can say. But repeated repeated commitment by the present prime minister that they are going to uh, form a minority commission. They have not done it. Even after this recent violence against the minority, there is a certainly I heard from the our law minister said we are going to uh, form quickly the minority commission. But after a few days, they said no, no, we are not going to do that. So that's the problem. The other thing, as Hina Ji already mentioned, that a regional entity because sir really it is ineffective completely. We do not have any platform at the government level to talk about these issues. It is definitely a South Asian issues. It is definitely a religious, uh, regional issues. As you said, you asked a question to the Monju that is their impact, it impact always badly. If anything happen in, in neighboring countries, it impacts seriously. You know, see, now we have seen that in India, it's an organized hate speech. So if it is an organized hate speech, how can you expect that Bangladeshi religious group will sit idle, they will not really uh, you know, um, really uh, take actions. So that is happening always, these energy issues and all these other issues. That's how it is a regional issues. That is most important. As Hina Zilani says, I agree with fully that we need to broaden the uh, our, our power, you know, broaden the, our friends and, and journalists. And so this, the civil society group should be strengthened because as a, as a, as a government level, we see the relationship is really, really weak. Uh, and the problem is Bangladesh is only the friend of India. India has no friend in South Asia. This is, you know, we know. So the people's people's connection is very important. And we should be very courageous to even Hina we, we may uh, be courageous in anything happen in South Asia, any country, we can go for investigation and fact finding, and we can, we can really uh, make protest. So otherwise, uh, if you, we cannot deal it South Asian level, regional level, it will continue. It is. It is not reducing. It is continuing every day. So it is aggravating the problems further. So how can we really, as you ask this question, how can we really fight for this? We need to be very courageous in South Asian level. We need to train the people. We need to train the young people to so come forward. Uh, so otherwise, we cannot handle this. So people's is is only answer. Otherwise, the government will not do that. This is the, the other, uh, you know, all South Asian country is, is moving the same way. Thank you. And okay. other thing is important that we must say this in a fundamentalist group, even in Hindu religion in Bangladesh, the 10%, there recently I have seen last 10 years, <laughs> fundamentalist Hindus are growing. There is no Hindu Parishad. Now Hindi Parishad on the road, you know, so uh, on the roadside. And they are fighting. There's uh, even in Calcutta, you have seen that uh, how the uh, peoples are on the street to uh, really blaming the Bangladeshi government and all this. That's why it is happening. But on the other way around, if you look into the, uh, the <laughs> in depth analysis, you will find that it impacted here. If something happened here, and again within a day, within a minute, 
it goes to other countries and there is a protect in tripura and calcutta and other other countries as well so it's a very complicated issues you know uh, it's uh, impacted uh, linking in any many ways thank you thank you very much and this is something for us to be mindful of uh, that our own nations really affects as well i would suggest that both pakistan and bangladesh people examine what both the national human rights commission which is a a statutory body that is completely uh, ineffective to the point of being an organ of the state uh, is and i think that uh, we are fully in agreement given the fact that we share the macaulay code with both pakistan and with bangladesh that we do have laws that uh, perfunctorily uh, govern hate speech but they for the most part they tend to be used against those who they are meant to uh, protect uh, i'll ask deepak if he's online to engage with some of the questions that we have uh, i have two that i would like to ask him as well uh, uh, ms deepak online he was having a problem uh, connecting i don't know whether that is still the case uh, seemingly not at the moment Aka, I think we have lost him. He's not online. No, he's he's right here. He's right here. He's he's around. He's around. He's camera's on. Yeah, but we we cannot hear you, Deepak. Uh, his mic is unmuted, but we can't still hear you. Oh. So why? So therefore, I'm saying. Mic online. Uh, the two questions that we have, uh, specifically, are a. uh how do we protect human rights defenders in the kind of environment that we live in and i think both for deepak and miss ajilani this is something that we can look at because it seems to be a common theme across south asia um uh, deepak are you uh, with us at this point miss ajilani yes uh, is that a question for me yes how how do we how do we protect those people who are human rights defenders but live in a very hostile environment across our six nations you know i um, uh, don't have an immediate answer to this because this is something that we've been trying to do effectively for a long time but not succeeding in doing it uh, we we have uh, uh, made um, protests uh, or voiced our concern with regard regard to the plight of human rights defenders that are being targeted in different south asian countries but really effectively what what have been we been able to do apart from one or two cases that i th i can think of where we collectively uh, organized something and and got some results um, i can't really think of a planned initiative for the defense of human rights defenders in this region i think we need to do more on this um a lot of what has happened to human rights defenders especially in india for instance is because of the kind of ngo policies that and uh, and the foreign um, funding policies that have been um, have been uh, adopted by by india and the way that they have criminalized uh, these uh, the 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 foreign funding uh, uh, policies and and targeted particular ngos especially the human rights community in, in in india this has happened in all countries let me not single out india but at the same time let me also say that um, in pakistan uh, it is it is it has already started so far none of the ngos have gone to jail because of it but we are likely to because they now implemented uh, enforced laws which would force us Uh, uh, to either submit or go to prison we are challenging them in courts let us hope that the courts will have a, a, a better sensitivity of how the civil society has to be respected as accountability force for the power of uh, to the power of the state if they don't recognize this then we are all in trouble i have a last question from the audience which i'll uh, ask of the panelists and uh, whoever wants to jump in on this can given the fact that social media is both a force for good in that we have a dog in the fight we have the ability now to be able to represent at least one side which would get suppressed normally in times where the state is dominating media what is it that we require to be done by the social media companies so that they become an ally in the fight for for 
free speech and they become an ally in the fight against hate speech. Maybe I'll ask, I'll start with Sajjad and if any of the others wants to jump in, they can. Oh, very quickly, uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is uh, enforce their own guidelines on how hate should not be enabled on their platform. These platforms are very powerful, right? Could you um, very quickly sort of illustrate for us very, very, very quickly how it is that they don't follow their own guidelines? Well, uh, I suppose uh, uh, first, I think there's this question about uh, uh, systems, protocols, etc. Uh, to try to uh, uh, flag up uh, hate and uh, dangerous speech on the platforms uh, and to take action against those. So I think that one is about the investment that they make uh, in a country as diverse, in a region as diverse as South Asia, speaking multiple languages, etc. And, uh, and, and so, so much of the conversation happens in local or natural languages, etc how many, uh, so it's about capacity, right? Meaning what is the kind of investment to try to identify what is dangerous speech and then you're able to take uh, action. So there's probably not that much of, a, uh, of, a, of an investment there uh, compared to what should what is required. Number two is also, even if uh, dangerous speech is identified, actually deciding whether you should take action. And that's where the question of Political affiliations, uh, political preferences, who is, you know, decisions, who are the people deciding, uh, the objectivity of decision making process. And we have seen there have been several uh, uh, issues with that. No, you're right. I think just as Ms. Ajilani spoke of the law being used against those it was intended to protect, we've seen that with the social media firms based out of the US. A lot of the times it is the people who are standing up for rights that are actually targeted by the state and the social media company just folds. Is there anybody else who would like to come in on this issue? If not, we will move to the close with Elaine Alam. Uh, sorry. Please, go ahead. Yes. Yes, just a quick, just a quick two uh, comments, which is one that uh, explicit uh, content is is easier to, to be moderated and removed as opposed to the implicit content. And that is something to look at. Uh, and also that there's sort of less interaction between the platforms. And so content, which is in violation of Facebook's community standards and is removed from Facebook is then observed on YouTube in, uh, instead. And then so hate speech and disinformation and misinformation moved from Facebook to uh, YouTube. Uh, so those are just two comments I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I hand over to Elaine Alam, I'd like to thank all of you for joining. Most of all, uh, I'll repeat that our report has uh, the link to the report is there in the chat. I would I would recommend very highly that you read it. Thank you to Ms. Ajilani for uh, joining us. You are uh, 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 absolutely epic and have been a source of inspiration for the way that many of us have chosen to live our lives. Um, we are very glad to have you with us and to have heard what you have said. I hope it is that policymakers across our part of the world listen to what it is that you have to say. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Elaine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Akar. Um, and uh, I actually wanted to say something on, on your previous question, and I think that's where it um, the point exactly comes in now on how you know we could also engage with this report, and I think that um, uh, and and also this is a question that came in. Um, somebody has just asked us if if we have uh, also looked at community guidelines and if we have engaged with the social media platforms to see whether or not they engage. Um, experts or, or on, on human rights in, in, in our region, uh, whether or not they have a policy like that or not. Um, uh, so to some extent, um, I, and I answered that question that we did um, uh, look at these community guidelines and uh, Sajad also addressed most of that part. Um, one of the thing, what I wanted to say also was that um, I think this is an opportunity uh, for this, for us right now, uh, coming up with a report directed on hate speech uh, to, to use um, this as advocacy also with, our so with social media platforms, with online platforms and with offline platforms to, to show and exhibit 
um, uh, what it does in, in, in all of our countries to show what um, hate speech in both these spaces does. Um, and if, um, uh, if these online communities um, are not aware, if they do not have enough opportunities to engage with uh, the sensitivities in our countries, this report gives us an opportunity to start with that engagement um, and, to, um, and to reveal for example, when we were talking about Ahmadiyya and Shias, um, the kind of hashtags and the kind of trends that, that start emerging, what that does exactly in, uh, in our offline spaces is also very sensitive and very important. So I think very importantly, um, our report um, this year, it gives us an opportunity to engage widely with civil society and for this report to be used. Um, and, and I think that, um, um, I'd also like to stress again, the report is available on the Minority Rights Group uh, website. It's also available on the South Asia Collective uh, website. Um, and any uh, sort of questions that, that come our way, uh, please feel free to also sh share your feedback and um, maybe also possibilities to engage uh, with the South Asia Collective, um, especially on advocacy. So uh, if it's advocacy um, in um, international uh, spaces or advocacy in regional or local spaces, this is where um, our findings, um, uh, the authors, the teams, um, um, and our, our uh, human rights fraternity could all come in, in, in uh, not just our country groups, but also transnationally. Um, and I feel that um, uh, why not use um, online spaces uh, counterintuitively to hate speech um, and um, start using um, uh, online spaces and showing the use of online spaces and engaging uh, communities positively. That might be a challenge and we might not ha have found the right way to do it yet. Um, um, but uh, maybe we could all engage um, uh, through this report also in, in, in using um, our online spaces um, uh, to, to maybe advocate more on what, what damage hate speech causes in, in both our offline and off, um, online spaces. Um, and uh, lastly, to end, um, I'd uh, also like to Again, a huge uh, uh, thanks to uh, Ms. Hina Jilani for accepting this invitation for most importantly writing uh, the foreword for our report. Uh, it really sets the tone for us. Um, it really gives us the boost um, that we need. Um, and uh, we hope that you stay part of our advocacy journey um, with this report and beyond. Um, Akar, many, many, many thanks uh, to you um, uh, for, for doing this and, and handling this so well. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, of course, Sajad, Shobha, um, there are a lot of uh, behind the scenes people who are not making themselves visible right now. Um, Abhi, uh, Abhimanyu, um, and uh, so thank you very much, uh, everybody and all our uh, country teams. Um, this was a challenge and I think Sudeshna had to bear the brunt of <laughs> most of it, but, uh, and uh, you pulled through really well. So thank you, everybody. I think I'm handing over to Sajad, right? No, no, no not, not to me, really. Right. Uh, it's time to conclude. But I just thought, uh, right. Elaine, if, uh, if there are any questions that have been uh, uh, posed that uh, yes. still remain unanswered, or if you want to engage a bit more, maybe we could spend uh, two, three minutes. There was one question particularly from uh, 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 the woman called Navya Khanna, Diversity yes. Diversity. Uh, you've written an, uh, a response. Uh, have anything further that uh, we could add to that? I think that's a great uh, offer, in a sense, to the South Asia Collective. Uh, and yes, absolutely. Please, uh, sorry, please. I uh, know maybe I can just add so the South Asia Collective if um, anybody who has uh, time to listen uh, we've uh, this has been a, a long journey Sajad mentioned in the beginning we've been working since the last four years forming this network coming up with uh, regular bulletins so uh, we invest our time um, and our uh, research skills our capacity into this annual report every year uh, this year our theme was uh, countering hate speech um, and um, the other thing that we do is also we we come up with a bulletin and and that bulletin is situational uh, it comes up and it's a very interesting bulletin it brings out the situation that has Taking, taken place in one quarter. Um, apart from that, we've been engaging with local partners in our uh, own countries. And um, uh, so we've been 
uh, a, a part of this is really small uh, small grants uh, for support to engage and uh, with more advocacy at at uh, the grassroots level um so any kind of uh, interesting ideas have been welcome in the past and hopefully you please keep your eyes open for uh, any such thing that you may see in the future um, as well on on the south asia collective uh, website and then um we're always happy to engage uh, locally um, on advocacy um, and any other such such uh, points and if i can if i can just just add and uh, uh, what lynn said I mean, the whole point of the South Asia Collective is to try to exactly as um, Zilani said, um, create these cross-border dialogues, uh, just get used to the fact that there's so much diversity within the region and that we can learn, we can work together, we can learn together, we can share things. So uh, especially uh, um, frontline, on the ground work by small entities, uh, minority groups, minority focus groups, uh, working on documenting, but also you know stuff like uh, supporting victim uh, groups, uh, uh, litigation work, advocacy work at the local level. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. Those <laughs> things that uh, that we'd be very interested to work with uh, you know, different partners. Uh, regional, international conversations get uh, you know take place. Uh, there are so many actors, uh, and and uh, that, that happens. But I think the a very difficult uh, uh, task uh, uh, on an issue of this of, of this nature is really getting things moving on the ground uh, in the communities, and if we can do that across borders, that would be fantastic. And that's exactly the whole point of the South Asia Collective. Uh, you know that uh, people in one country, minorities and major you know majorities supporting minorities in one country, and you know and similarly in other countries. Uh, creating that uh, uh, cross border linkage and, and just concern and empathy and, uh, and, and uh, supporting where each other as well. So, yes, definitely. Uh, and, and by the way, your uh, the name of the organization di uh, or the network diversity uh, sounds like exactly the group that uh, uh, we'd be very happy to uh, work with. Thank you. We'll reach out to you. And uh, with we we now conclude uh, again. Uh, I think so. With that, then um, uh, again, a big uh, thank you to everybody, or also to those who are listening, our attendees. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for registering, and um, please keep a lookout on on our social media handles as well as our websites. And uh, please do engage. Um, the idea is not for this to die down here and to speak about just one day. Um, it's it's to engage and to build more advocacy uh, locally, regionally, transnationally, cross borders, um, uh, and to write more, to engage more. So any way that you would like to pro provide feedback or engage with us, or if we have the opportunity to write more um, and to build advocacy on this, please uh, do get in touch with um, with us on the, uh, through the South Asia Collective website. Um, so thank you very much. Um, all the speakers, uh, our organizers, uh, MRG, uh, Minority Rights U uh, Group UK, your entire team. Um, uh, again, a big thank you to you. Um, so Ifra is um, uh, all covered up uh, and Shoba and uh, Nomana, uh, you're here too. Um, uh, the team at MRG Loic, thank you very much. And um, uh, all the country teams, again, social science Baha, I, I, um, I would like to mention uh, you as well uh, for, for pulling this whole thing through um, actually you know getting the final uh, shape out of uh, the report making it look the way it does look right now thank you very much um, so Deshna and Deepak um, uh, you've always been around and um, um, once again finally our um, uh, country teams um, um, our uh, honorable keynote speaker and forward writer uh, Ms. Hina Jalani thank you it's uh, it, the honor doesn't stop so thank you very much and um, uh, of course Akar thanks a lot thank you everybody goodbye <laughs>